When the New Testament writers want to um, explain Jesus' death and resurrection, very often they give, you, give us a kind of visual picture of Christ going down in order to go up again. It's one of the most characteristic patterns in the New Testament. Christ descending and then ascending. We just heard it in the Philippians text that Christ who is equal with God empties himself of all that and starts descending and comes right down and makes contact with us in our plight and then goes as low as you can go dying, even dying a shameful death and then God exalts him and he goes up again. Well, the Creed uses, you could think of the Gospel of John as another example of this descending in order to ascend. Uh, the whole Gospel of John follows that sort of visual pattern that Christ starts out up, goes down and is ascended again. The Creed follows that New Testament pattern when it speaks of Christ who is uh, eternally with God, Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. And uh, in today's line from the Apostles' Creed, we confess that this one descended into hell and the third day was raised again and ascended into heaven. Sydney's got a handout that she's going to circulate as well. Thank you, Sydney. In the ancient church, there was a tradition of religious art called iconography. I've talked about it once before in an evening service, so some of you would have heard about it there. But this was a, an ancient tradition of trying to convey visually the message of the gospel, trying to um, express the truths of scripture in a visual form, so that just by looking at the picture you could contemplate the, uh, the message of Scripture. And the icon of Christ's resurrection, which Sydney has just kindly passed around, um, this is the way the resurrection is depicted in this tradition of art. If you've ever seen a Western painting of the resurrection, Usually you see Christ hovering in the air about four feet above the ground, the grave is empty behind him, the soldiers are sleeping on the ground in front of him. The resurrection in Western art is portrayed as a miracle that happens to Christ. And he's all alone up there in the air and we're just meant to marvel, we're meant to go, wow. In the Eastern Church though, the resurrection is portrayed quite differently. Here you see Christ standing over two broken doors. You see those doors down below? And all around in the darkness you can see broken chains and broken locks and um, uh, keys. That's a representation of hell, the place of the dead portrayed as a place down under the ground where the dead go. Christ has just gone down there and he has broken the chains, he's smashed the locks and then he's unhinged the doors of hell and as he rises from death he stands over the doors, over those broken gates of hell but he's not alone. This is not like a Western painting where he's just in the air and we're meant to worship and adore him. Do you see the characters on either side? Does anyone know who they are? An old man and an old woman. It's a clue if I say it's a very, very old man and a very, very old woman. The, these uh, represent Adam and Eve. So here we have Adam and Eve, the the head of the whole human family, the representatives of the whole human race. And do you notice how Christ's grabbing them? He hasn't, he hasn't reached out his hand and said, come take my hand and I'll save you. Isn't that from the Terminator or something? Come with me if you want to live. It's not that. 
See how he has grabbed their limp wrists. They are powerless to help themselves. They are in the place of the dead and Christ has seized them by their lifeless arms and has raised them with him. Here's the crucial... And, and, and gathered around on the side, you can see uh, the whole company of humanity. You can see figures from the Old Testament and from the New Testament all gathered around. There is a crowd of living witnesses as Christ tramples down the gates of hell and rises into the glory of God. Oh, the person with the halo on the left, that's John the Baptist bearing witness to Jesus, the forerunner, as they call him in the Orthodox Church. Um, the crucial difference between this one and those Western paintings is that Christ's resurrection here is not just something that happens to him. It's not just an isolated miracle that we're meant to marvel at and say, isn't that wonderful? He died and then came to life again. It's not just a kind of marvel for us to look at. Christ's resurrection is something that happens to us. It happens to Adam and Eve. It happens to the whole human family. He goes down into the place of the dead. He takes hold of the captives. And as he rises, they rise with him. As he ascends into God's presence, he takes the dead with him. He's holding on to them. Not holding them by the hands, but grasping their limp wrists and raising them up out of that place of the dead. And hell in this icon is that black, empty place at the bottom. There's nobody there. The gates are broken. The hinges have come off. And the captives are ascending with Christ. The New Testament speaks about hell or the place of the dead as a kind, very much like this picture actually, as a place under the ground where the dead have gone. And in a number of places the New Testament describes exactly what the icon here is, is showing us. That Jesus descends down to where the dead are and then ascends up again. The text from... Um, let me read you some of these. Ephesians 4. Verse um, 7, but to each of us, but each, but each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. Verse 9, when it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens. Do you see the pattern? He goes down into the bowels of the earth and then he ascends to the highest place. The second letter of Peter, no, the first letter of Peter, sorry, chapter 3, um, speaks of Christ. This is a rather mysterious passage, but here's what it says. Um, uh, that Christ, verse 18, Christ was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, etc., etc. Um, and then it speaks in verse 21 of the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers made subject to him. Same pattern there. He went down into the spirit, proclaimed peace to the captives and then ascended up to the highest place through his resurrection and all things are subject to him. And the reading we've just heard from Philippians you get the same picture of the descent and ascent, but did you notice at the end it says, uh, God has highly exalted Jesus, given him the name above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There it is again. This place of emptiness where the dead have gone has become a place where Christ's name is confessed. And according to 1 Peter, the place of the dead, the prison, 
where those who die languish has become a place where Christ's word is proclaimed. And in Ephesians, the place of the dead has become one of the venues of Christ's presence. We think of death as emptiness, as separation from God, as being torn apart from the source of life. But the message of the New Testament is that death is not separation from God. Death is a place where God has made contact. God made contact with us by coming in the flesh. But then God went right to the source of our problem. God descended to the deepest part of our human plight. God made contact with death itself and filled death with Christ's presence and those those ears of the dead that can no longer hear heard the joyful news of Jesus Christ. And those prisoners who couldn't raise a finger to help themselves were grasped and held by, uh, the, by, the, the, by Christ as he rose. He descended to the dead. He descended into hell. In the early church, um, this message of Christ's descent and resurrection produced a really strange attitude towards death. The early Christians, if you were an outsider, if you were a good, respectable, pagan Roman citizen, one of the things that was most offensive to you about the Christians was their horrible kind of affection towards the dead. Did you know that when Christians wanted to have a prayer meeting, one of their favorite places to go and pray was not a church building, but down into the tomb, standing among the bones of the dead. And you would light the Christ candle and pray, and you would feel specially close to God when you were there surrounded by the bodies of the dead. Sometimes in a special celebration, you could have a church service down under the ground in the catacombs where the dead were laid. When someone was martyred, when the Roman state put someone to death for their faith. Here's what the Christians would do. They would grab the body of this dead saint, raise them up in the air. You know like in a football game or something when the person who scores the a soccer game, the person who scores the winning goal, everyone spontaneously lifts them up onto their shoulders and parades them through. That's exactly what the early Christians did with the bodies of their dead witnesses, the faithful dead who have proclaimed Christ's resurrection with their own blood. They would raise them in the air and parade them through the streets of the city. And all the saints would come out to catch a glimpse of this faithful witness. And if you could, if you were close enough, you'd reach out to touch that body, thinking that the spirit that empowered this body to this person to bear witness might still be on them and there are many stories of miracles as people would as the shadow of the dead body would pass by the sick or as you manage to touch them there are even stories of Christians kissing the bodies of the dead with reverence with love with gratitude for the witness that they have borne now, one of the Romans who wrote a book criticizing the Christians, this is one of the things he complained about. He said, their attitude towards the dead, towards death, is absolutely disgusting. It's a contamination. In ancient Rome, the cemeteries were always outside the city. It wasn't like in a place like Sydney where there's a local cemetery and, you know, you can go to your little cemetery in the suburb and, and drive past it. There were, in Roman law, the cemetery had to be at least two miles away from the borders of the city. Death was seen as a contamination. There's nothing good about death. You don't want to look upon the dead. You don't want a visual reminder that people have died. You exclude them from the place of the living. Death was a contamination. It was something to be completely left outside the places of human habitation. And and so when Christians acted this way towards the, de the death, it was seen as if they were contaminated, as if they had this disgusting, um, uh, uh, as if the border between life and death, which was obvious to everybody else in the ancient world, as if Christians didn't understand that boundary. You don't touch the bodies of the dead. 
Don't you understand there's an absolute boundary between the living and the dead? Well, Christians thought that was the boundary that Christ had overcome by breaking the gates of hell and rising. Anyway, this, this Roman who wrote a book against the Christians, he said, they raise the bodies of their executed criminals. We call them martyrs, Rome called them criminals. They raise their bodies and parade them through the cities. And he said, what if a good devout pagan is on his way to the temple to make a sacrifice and he accidentally just glimpses that body as it passes? Won't it contaminate his soul so that he'll be unable to make the sacrifice? You see, this was seen as Christians were sort of corrupting the whole spiritual tone of a good, well-ordered pagan civilization. Why did believers act this way towards the dead? You know, by the way, if you've, if you've, if you've ever traveled to Europe, you know that the great churches are built over the bodies of dead saints. The reason St. Peter's, the great basilica in Rome is called St. Peter's, is it's believed to be located directly over the bones of St. Peter. Um, and again, you can go down into the catacombs beneath great cathedrals and pray there among the dead. What is it that's happened to the Christians that makes them have this rather macabre affection towards those who've died? Well, it must be that death itself has changed somehow because of Jesus where everybody else sees only horror and darkness and despair, Christians see broken gates, smashed locks, an empty place where no one dwells anymore because Christ has gone there and led captivity captive. It must mean that death itself is different because of Christ. That must be why Christians think so differently from everybody else about death. Now, in our time, uh, one of the, I think one of the things people are worried about with Christianity, doesn't this story about Jesus dying and rising again, doesn't this give you a rather, I mean, isn't it just wish fulfillment? Everyone's scared of dying. Isn't this just a way of comforting ourselves because we're frightened of death? Doesn't it produce a rather unrealistic view of death if, if we're acting as if we've just, we're continuing to live? Um, doesn't Christianity somehow deny death? Isn't it a bit of a fantasy, a bit of a wish fulfillment, a way of, of avoiding the hard fact of human dying? Do you see what I mean? The message of a risen Christ, isn't it a, isn't it a failure to take death seriously? Well, let me ask you this. Do you think our society looks more like these early Christians parading the bodies of the dead? Or do you think it looks more like the ancient Roman pagan civilization where you shun death and completely remove it from your field of view? Don't we live in a society that is gripped by a kind of fevered denial of death? Just think of the way we relate to the aged. Think of the way we treat the elderly. Now growing old is a fact of life. If you happen to be born, one of the things that's going to happen to you along life's way you know, you'll learn to crawl, you'll learn to walk, you'll reach puberty, and you'll start to age. It's just a fact of life. But don't we treat aging as if it's, it's either a crime or a disease? It's, it's something that we ought to, uh, you know, we want to go one up on ancient Rome. Let's actually, if we could remove all the old people to two miles outside the city, that would be even better. Because it's a reminder of our mortality, and we're not very comfortable with that. We don't like, our society does not like frailty. Our society doesn't quite know what to do with dying. And think about all the recent discussion about normalizing euthanasia. What's behind this? 
obviously there are all you know if you're involved in aged care obviously there are there are all sorts of difficult borderline cases um, but this idea that euthanasia ought to be normalized that the normal way we think about dying should include this uh, in Greek euthanasia a good dying a good one nothing bad here this is a good way to go isn't this also a kind of denial of death isn't this also a way of saying oh no death isn't death isn't doesn't have any power over you death is just one of the many medical things that we can control death is one of the many situations that we can bring under our own medical expertise you can choose when to go isn't this also in a strange way as if we can't bear to look at death and we have to avert our eyes we'll even call it something else euthanasia don't we live in a society that can't take death seriously there's a tendency in funerals in recent years in the West to have bodiless funerals a funeral where the body of the deceased person is not there it's what is this? Well, it's a memorial for all of us left behind to have catharsis and to share our grief and to, um, you know, and we'll tell stories, we'll show a multimedia presentation showing the beautiful life this person had. But we don't even refer to, we don't even use the word death anymore. We say that someone has passed away. Oh, they've, no, he's not with us anymore, he's gone. Aren't we terrified of even naming death? Aren't we living in a society that's gripped by a denial of death? Just think, once we've legalized euthanasia, we'll be able to say, oh, not that he's passed away, we'll be able to say, oh, he's not with us anymore. We passed him on. Um, aren't we trying to bring death under our control in such a way that death itself, the actual fact of dying, disappears? It goes outside the city two miles away, and we never have to look at it anymore. By contrast, not only do Christians take death seriously, actually there's, if anyone's interested in this, there's a book called Accompany Them With Singing by a, a chap named Thomas Long and it's about trying to recover a Christian understanding of what a funeral service is that a funeral is a place where death is taken seriously and it's taken seriously not just as something that happens to us who are left behind but death is something that has happened to this person this body around which we gather the Christian message takes death with terrible seriousness because the Christian message says that even God takes death seriously that in Jesus Christ, God has stared death right in the face and has stared it down. That God couldn't, it's as if to say God couldn't have redeemed us without making contact with death itself. That's how serious death is. And yet, the Christian message refuses to take death with ultimate seriousness. Oh yes, it's real, it's a fact. But death's not the last word that will be spoken over your life. The word of Christ's peace is the last word. Oh yes, death's serious, but it's not as serious as the grace and joy and life of the risen Christ. It's a message of a crucified and risen Savior that sets us free to look death in the eye, but to see it as something ultimately that has been tamed by Jesus Christ not just as a wild beast that will devour us death has become if you like Christ's dangerous pet he's got it on a leash we still die one of the church fathers said but not as those who are condemned we die as those who are entering into life 
In one, of the, in one of the burial services of the Eastern Orthodox Church, I'll end with this. In one of the burial services of the Orthodox Church, part of the body of the dead is wrapped in swaddling cloths, like you would use to wrap a baby. A reminder, a symbol, that death for believers is really a kind of birth. An entry into fullness of life. And here's a mysterious thing. When you were baptized, you were baptized into what? Into Christ's death. It's as if the death and resurrection of Jesus have completely turned the whole picture upside down. By nature, all of us are on a journey from birth towards death. But by grace, we are on a journey from death, a sharing in Christ's death, towards birth, into fullness of life, into the joy and unbounded life of the risen Lord, to whom be glory and praise forever. Amen.